Welcome everyone to our next level SMB security session. My name is David Bjarman Burr. I'm a security architect with Microsoft. With me today is Alex Fields from Success Computer Consulting. Thanks, David. Yeah, I'm Alex Fields. I'm with Success Computer Consulting and managed services provider for a lot of small and mid-sized organizations as well. I have a widely read blog, itpromentor.com. And today we want to talk a little bit about mapping the CIS controls framework to your deployment of Microsoft 365 Business Premium. So by way of agenda, we're going to talk about why use a cybersecurity framework. As well, I want to go over the NIST cybersecurity framework, which is a very well-known standard. A lot of people are familiar with that. And compare it to something a little simpler, uh, something that I like to recommend for small and mid-sized organizations called the CIS critical security controls. So we'll do a brief overview of that and move into some Microsoft 365 business premium strategies that you can use to help to solve for some of those security controls. So why use a cybersecurity framework? This is a question I get quite a bit, Alex. You know, a lot of partners ask me, you know, why use a framework, you know, when you can find a ton of information online, use secure score, et cetera, things like that. It's certainly helped our organization okay so like we thought that we were doing a pretty good job with security um, but once we actually adopted a formal framework we quickly found there were a lot of gaps you know and um, by starting to plug some of those gaps we we're really able to differentiate ourselves in the marketplace so one reason that i would suggest or offer if anyone has ever got a couple free moments to spare go ahead and look up the Data Breach Incident Report. Uh, this is released by Verizon every year. So they catalog, uh, this year it was almost 4,000 breaches. And the interesting thing that this report found, they like to map these breach incidents against the critical security controls. And they like to say, you know, here are the top things that if only the organizations had been meeting these controls, they could have prevented or mitigated the cybersecurity incidents. And the interesting thing in this report is that even meeting these controls to a very low level, you can completely prevent the top four attacks and partially mitigate every other attack that they cataloged. And that's simply meeting it to a very basic level, which we'll talk about implementation group one. Wow, that's awesome. You know, how does this help the bottom line of success computing? Uh, it helps quite a bit, actually. So this is some of the best uh, piece to it. Like once we actually started adopting this framework, and we learned where some of the gaps that we had were, well, that meant we had more work to do, okay? And so naturally we just started to end up billing more, right? By doing some additional project work and so forth, but that also opened opportunities for some additional recurring revenue as well. Now, initially we were selling our cybersecurity services as an add-on, but we are now at the point here in 2020, we feel that it's so fundamental that it's just a part of what we offer in the marketplace to be a, customer of ours at all, you need to you need to be implementing certain things, and that comes with a certain price tag. Now, it means that we're not the cheapest provider in town, for sure, but uh, we also differentiate ourselves that way. So it's been very valuable. Have you guys seen a reduction in you know operational friction or amount of work you have to do for these customers once they're all set up and, and you know following at least some of the cybersecurity framework you've implemented? Definitely. So once the interesting thing about implementing good security is it comes with good management. So it's really helped us to mature how we manage organizations and networks. And it, in fact, when customers upgrade into this new scenario where we're managing them according to these critical security controls, typically the volume of tickets goes down. And that's not a bad problem, actually, because it means that you have the capacity to bring on, you know, more subscribers. OK. So it actually ends up increasing your revenue, not decreasing it. It's very, very interesting. Now, with regard to the critical security controls, I like to just take a moment and compare this to another framework that a lot of people are more familiar with. The National Institutes of Standards and Technology publishes a cybersecurity framework. But that framework is uh, actually a program framework, okay? Now, a program framework is going to take more time and experience to implement versus a control framework. And that's what CIS controls is. So the CIS controls have already done the work of creating a cybersecurity program. And it's really just a checklist essentially of 
top items that you need to be implementing to just meet a good baseline of security. So it doesn't take a lot of time and experience. There's not a lot of decisions to make. You just move forward with whichever implementation group you're selecting. Now, the National Institute, Institute of Standards and Technology publishes this framework, and it's, it's, uh, you know, it's made up of three components. The framework core, which is what most people think about when they think about this framework. It's the categories identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. These functions are basically the highest level of abstraction for any cybersecurity activity that you're trying to, any outcome that you're driving towards. Okay. So for example, you know, one of the functions is identify, right? Within that function, which is just a high level abstraction of cybersecurity activities, we can break that into categories. An example of a category might be asset management. And that category can be further divided into subcategories, which are getting closer to what we would consider controls. These are very specific technical or management activities that you need to accomplish in order to meet the spirit of this category. So for example, one subcategory is called physical devices and systems within the organization or inventory. And that sounds an awfully lot like the first critical security control in CIS, inventory and control of hardware assets. Now, the CIS controls, as I mentioned, they're a little bit different than the NIST framework. The NIST framework is a massive, just massive collection of all these categories and subcategories. There's like over 150 items that you need to consider, and they don't even claim those are completely exhaustive. They're just a bunch of suggestions. They don't give you any priority in it. They don't say, hey, this is better to implement first versus something else. They just say you should be looking at all of these things and de deciding for yourself and prioritizing according to your risk tolerance, the, uh, the risks that your organization is likely to face in whatever vertical or industry you're in. And so there's not really a lot of guidance just beyond this framework. Whereas the CIS controls, like they've already pre-selected the items for you and put them into a very specific order. Okay, and so they arrange these top 20 controls into three categories. And again, they recommend this implementation order, starting with the basic security controls. Now, the basic security controls are important because if you don't do these things, you're potentially undermining any later control in the system. So for example, let's pick on one of the later controls under the foundational section, data protection. How can you be sure that you're adequately protecting your data if you don't have an accurate inventory of your hardware assets or your software assets? You're not managing vulnerability with regard to those things. You don't have any controlled use of administrative privilege in the environment. Obviously the answer is you could not possibly guarantee that your data is protected if you're not doing these basic things. And so that's why whenever we start engaging with a customer, we always start with these basic controls. Now the controls are broken down further into what are known as implementation groups. So each one of those controls, uh, there's actually multiple sub controls underneath there, which are activities that you can complete in order to meet the spirit of that control. But not every organization has to complete all of the activities. And so they've broken those activities out into these implementation groups. Now, for a small business, they would most likely focus on implementation group one. A medium-sized business might aim more towards implementation group two, which, by the way, includes everything that implementation group one includes and some other stuff. And then implementation group three is the most all-inclusive, containing a lot more things that an organization would have to do to meet the spirit of that control to a higher degree. Usually it takes a lot more budget. But again, an enterprise organization, you know, they have thousands of seats they're managing, a lot more software packages, devices and locations all over the world, potentially. And so that's a really different attack area and a really different set of threats. But David, is there a reason that an organization, even if they're a smaller size business, they might aim for a different implementation group? Of course, I, I like to encourage businesses to focus on their tolerance for risk or their you know, need to avoid risk. You know, a good example is a, a small law firm you know, with a, maybe a dozen associates and a couple partners that focuses on celebrity clients. You know, they may be a small, a very small firm. However, the nature of their business um, and and the potential risk to their business should something you know leak, so to speak, um, 
to be catastrophic. Therefore, they may choose a higher implementation group um, regardless of their, their company size. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, you know, when we start working with customers very often, especially in a small and mid-sized market, they, they're not anywhere close to meeting implementation group three or even two. So we always start with one, even if they want to select some of the subcontrols out of a later group uh, down the road. We always start by, uh, you know, implementing a baseline with implementation group one. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. So when we talk about some of these critical security controls in the next section, you know, we'll focus uh, entirely in within that implementation group one and uh, only on the basic controls, not the whole framework. So as an example of these sub controls and implementation groups, if you take a look at the very first critical security control, there's actually eight items that they want you to complete in order to meet the spirit of this control. But again, that's for implementation group three, right? Each one of these eight items is going to also be mapped to the NIST cybersecurity functions. So, you know, identify, protect, respond, et cetera. So there's some mapping there. And as well, for implementation group one, you'll notice that the scope is fairly constrained, right? There's only a couple of things that you really need to make sure you're doing. This is sort of a baseline level. You know, you must do at least these things if you want to meet the spirit of having an inventory and control over your hardware assets maintaining a detailed asset inventory, as well as addressing unauthorized assets. So that's just an example. So Alex, I noticed these controls are vendor agnostic. If I'm an MSP primarily selling Microsoft, you know, Microsoft 365 or Office 365 to my customers, how can this help me? Yeah, that's a good question. So when Success started looking for ways to solve the CIS control framework, because we were actually starting from security, not necessarily from a, a product with any vendor. Um, we began by trying to say, okay, how can we implement a really good level of security at SMB affordable prices, right? And what we found was that the Microsoft 365 business premium SKU really helped get us as far along that journey as we wanted to go, uh, even beyond implementation group one, actually. You can actually get into a lot of the items two and three. And so, and, and and it's very affordable, right? So it's like a in the U.S. anyways, it's like a twenty dollar per user per month SKU, and that's very affordable, very attractive for small businesses. Uh, includes all their productivity apps, all the things that they normally get in 365, and a whole bunch of other you know security and compliance and management related features that help us to meet these critical security controls and really drive value. So we're going to just go through the basic controls. The basic controls again are just these first six. And that's just due to the time constraints of this presentation. Okay, you can continue to go further after that into the layout foundational and organizational controls. Um, but for the purposes of this presentation, we're just gonna focus on what you can do with Microsoft 365 Business Premium to help you meet the spirit of the basic controls. Now, with regard to this first control, inventory and control of hardware assets, they want us to do two things. One is we must maintain a detailed asset inventory, and that's whether these assets are connected to the network or not. And as well, we need to address unauthorized assets. So being able to remove assets that are no longer allowed to connect to the network or prevent assets that shouldn't be allowed to connect to the network in the first place. So this is actually one of the most attractive features for us. Um, there's a feature called device-based conditional access. Now, in order to utilize this feature, you should enroll your devices with Intune first, okay? And once your devices are enrolled, you can actually put up a gate that says, if you're not in our management framework, if you're not enrolled with Intune, you don't have access to the company resources like email or documents. So that's highly powerful. That controls your inventory very quickly. And as well, you can enable some device cleanup rules so that at the end of the life cycle of those devices, as they haven't been in contact uh, with the management framework for a while, they will automatically be retired and they'll thereby lose access. So that's also a nice feature to automatically be able to take care of those things. Now, um, I think we might just pause here for a minute. I wanna men mention that, you know, this isn't going to solve for everything. It certainly helps you with your endpoints and it's really attractive because those endpoints don't have to be connected to a local network. They can be anywhere in the world, but you still have to make some kind of, um, you know, you have to come up with a way of solving the same control, but for your network devices as well on your local area network, you might, you know, your, your switches, your routers, your firewalls, your wireless access points. So that's an important thing to have an inventory of as, as well. But as far as endpoints are concerned, which is usually the first place where a breach incident starts unfolding. Um, so the endpoints are highly, highly important. And this is the a really good place to start. 
So David, if you would, if could you do us a quick demo of uh, joining a device to Intune and uh, turning on conditional access? Sure, Alex. For reference, the steps I'm about to show are documented at aka.ms forward slash enroll windows. First, I'm going to enroll this Windows 10 device with Intune. If this were a new device, I would simply sign in with my work account during the out-of-box experience. Since this one is already set up, I will open the settings app, select accounts, access worker school, and then connect. Since this is a company owned device, I will select join this device to Azure Active Directory and then sign in with my work account. I verify that this is the correct organization and click join. I'm all set. The device is now enrolled. Next, I will create a conditional access policy that requires a compliant device to access data in my Microsoft 365 tenant. These steps are documented at aka.ms forward slash CA. Starting from the Microsoft Admin Center, I open the Azure Active Directory Admin Center. I browse to Azure Active Directory, Security, Conditional Access. I select New Policy and name it Require Compliant Device. Under Assignments, I select Users and Groups and include all users. I then exclude my organization's conditional access exclusion group I previously configured so that I don't accidentally lock myself out if I make a mistake. Under Cloud Apps or Actions, I include all cloud apps and then exclude the Microsoft Intune enrollment so new devices can access the enrollment page. Under Conditions, Device Platforms, I'm only going to apply this policy to Windows devices since I prefer to use MAM policies to control iOS and Android devices. Under Conditions, Client Apps, I select Configure and leave the default selected. Under Access Controls, Grant, I select Require Device to be marked as Compliant. I confirm my settings, then set my Enable policy to On. Since I already excluded my organization's conditional access exclusion group, I'll proceed without excluding myself from the policy. Finally, I select Create to enable my new device-based conditional access policy. Back to you, Alex. Thanks, David. Moving on to critical security control number two, inventory and control of software assets. Here they have three different things we're being asked to achieve. One, having an inventory of authorized software. Two, making sure that software is supported with security updates. And last, having a way to address unapproved software. So what can we do with Microsoft 365? The first thing to note is that you can deploy using autopilot. This means that your devices will enroll into Intune and all of the software that they need will come down to them based on who that user is who's signing into the device. And that's really important because it means that end users don't need to have the privilege to install software themselves. And that will help you to control what software packages are out there you know, in your environment. Now, this actually also helps you to solve critical security control number four, which is coming up. It's all about limiting the admin privilege. So it's kind of nice to get a two for here. As well, we have Cloud App Discovery. This is a tool that you can use to locate apps in your environment and to make visible some apps that might be hiding out in what we call shadow IT. And whenever I run this report, organizations are surprised to learn about apps that are being used that they had no idea were being used in their environment to store corporate data. So personal Dropbox accounts and the like, okay? Once those things are made visible, then the organization can start making decisions about whether to block some of those things, or maybe they do want to allow the use of those apps, but then they can choose to apply some protection to them. But again, you know, knowledge is key, starting with that discovery. And last, we also have something known as admin consent requests. So this will allow you to create an approval process if a user is trying to provision a new app that's going to connect to the Microsoft 365 environment in some way. Because again, Microsoft 365 is very has a very rich third-party ecosystem and a lot of apps out there that could potentially connect to your environment. But you can put up a wall so that you know, users have to go through an approval process to, to make that happen. Moving to critical security control number three, continuous vulnerability management. Here we need to deploy automated operating system patch management tools, as well as tools to patch our third-party software. Now, just to be straightforward with you right away, you know, 
there are no third-party up auto updates like built into Microsoft 365. So you'll still need a way to account for that. All right. But with regard to the operating system, you know, that is built in. So Windows Update for Business, you can control what are known as update rings. So the pace of updates, you can control maintenance windows where updates can't get installed during working hours and stuff like that. Or you can choose to release feature updates, you know, on a schedule that is controlled by the IT department. Okay, so you can do both. There's one other feature that I wanted to mention here. It's not part of the business subscription by default. This is an add-on. Uh, it's called Microsoft Defender ATP, and it comes with something known as threat and vulnerability management. And that's really important because even though it won't auto-update your software, it will make visible any known vulnerabilities. Okay, so any of the CVEs that have been released for the software packages on your endpoints, those will show up in your portal, and you can manage against that. And you can say, oh, hey, we should really update this. This is a you know, a high risk uh, app. Now, again, as I mentioned, you need the Microsoft Defender ATP add-on. Previously, this was only available for enterprise, but um, it is actually possible if you're a CSP to add this as a subscription to even the business subscription now. Next, we have controlled use of administrative privilege. Two things here. Number one, ensuring the use of dedicated administrative accounts. So different accounts than the accounts that you would use for browsing your email, or the internet or doing anything else that's uh, you know a standard user activity. You want those to be separate. And that includes on the workstation, which we talked about with Autopilot already. As well, we have uh, use of multi-factor authentication for administrative access, okay? So we can do these things pretty easily, right? I mentioned we already went over Autopilot a little bit. In the Microsoft 365 Admin Center, you can also constrain the admin privileges that you hand out. So not everybody needs to be a global administrator, right? You can delegate lower levels of privileges as needed. So sometimes your customers might need to, you know, implement uh, licenses. Sometimes they have to attach new licenses and bring up new accounts and spin old accounts down. You know, you can delegate the license administrator role and they'll have the ability to do those things. Or if they need to reset passwords or something, you can give them like the help desk administrator role, right? They don't necessarily need to be global admins. So you should definitely be taking advantage of that with your standard user accounts and making sure again, that you're just keeping your global admin accounts separate. As well, it is possible to turn on multi-factor authentication very easily using the security defaults or some simple conditional access policies. Um, you know, it's important to note when you do that, you can actually meet critical security control number 16 at the same time, which is going to pertain to multi-factor authentication for all your other users, not just your administrative users. And now critical security control number five. This is one of my favorites, the security, the secure configuration for hardware and software. Three things we have to do here, establish secure configuration. So determine what those are gonna be and document them. Then deploying some kind of central system configuration management tool so you can push those settings out. And then finally having a way to monitor those configurations so you can see when there's drift. So Intune does all of these things very nicely. So if you've already enrolled your devices into Intune for control number one, then you're set up to do uh, a lot of really good things here. The first thing is, uh, you know, there are really easy ways to deploy some device configuration profiles uh, where you can just have your own custom configuration. You make the decisions about what you want to turn on or off. Microsoft also publishes something known as security baselines where they've already made a lot of the decisions for you. And you can kind of get a really good solid understanding of what good security looks like, you know, coming from the vendor's mouth themselves, right? Microsoft. So very, very cool. Um, I'd recommend checking them out, although be aware that not every setting, not every policy setting that's included in the baselines is compatible with the business subscription. Some of that stuff is enterprise only right now, and they don't have a business optimized version of the baseline. Uh, but it's nevertheless a really good reference, and I would, I would recommend checking it out. And then finally, for mobile devices, you can apply app protection policies. Now, this is something that will help you to meet the spirit of some of those controls uh, just in a different way by managing all of the applications and data on the mobile devices and putting a fence around that, you can kind of manage the apps rather than the device, but still meet some of the requirements like data protection and so forth. Now, one last thing I wanna mention here is that as you start to apply these device configuration profiles, security baselines, app protection policies, you're gonna like accidentally start meeting a lot of the other critical security controls, okay? So, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 13, 16, a whole bunch of other ones will become uh, you're going to be made at least partially meeting some of those things just by turning on some of these profiles. Okay, so really important to understand that. Um, and it was all made possible just by getting devices onboarded with Intune in the first place. 
So with that, I think we'll pause one more time for a demo. David, if you would uh, show us how to deploy some of those security baseline policies, it'd be great. Sure, Alex. For this demo, I'll show a quick and easy way to get started with Windows 10 device configuration or MDM policies. Starting from the Microsoft Admin Center, I click on Devices and then Policies. Notice there are already policies for iOS and Android. These are the default app protection or MAM policies created by the setup wizard that cover five foundational CIS controls. To create an MDM policy for Windows 10, I click Add, name my policy, and set the policy type to Windows 10 device configuration. By ensuring that Windows 10 devices are kept up to date automatically, I can check off critical security control number three for continuous vulnerability management. And by enforcing Defender Antivirus, I can check off foundational control number eight for malware defenses. I add this policy to all users. However, I could easily create different policies for different groups of users. What I just showed was a simplified wizard that makes it very easy to get started with MDM. When I'm ready to tackle more advanced tasks, such as configuring Wi-Fi or VPN, I can interact with this policy or create new ones. To do that, I will click on the Endpoint Manager Admin Center and browse to Devices, Configuration Profiles. The MDM policy we just created is here. However, there are many more settings in this specialist workspace. I can also create policies for iOS, Android, and macOS. The default app protection policies I showed earlier are under Apps, App Protection Policies. There's a lot to Intune, way more than we have time for today. So I'm going to hand it back to you, Alex. Thanks, David. Moving on to critical security control number six. This is the last of the basic critical security controls. Maintenance, monitoring, and analysis of audit logs. Two requirements here. First, you have to activate audit logging to make sure that uh, you have data to look at. This is really important because when you have a breach incident occur, you need to go back and look at a record of what happened so you can determine the extent of the attack and you can help to understand and limit the attack a little bit better and to also regain control of your environment more efficiently. So it's really important to have that audit logging enabled. And then you also want to be able to, you know, surface anomalous and abnormal events. So that's another important consideration. Now, out of the box, you can configure these things. It's not on by default, but you can certainly um, go to the Security and Compliance Center, turn on the unified audit log, which will start logging activity, at least in your cloud applications. So Exchange Online, OneDrive for Business, SharePoint Teams, and so on. And as well, you can configure alert policies. And the alert policies will notify you when strange things are happening in the environment, right? Suspicious email sending patterns, um, you know, exchange online uh, privilege escalation, and some other stuff. So go I would recommend checking those out, making sure that those alerts are going to someone, going to a monitored mailbox, someone who's watching over the environment and can respond to those incidents, right? Last, I did want to mention again, Microsoft Defender ATP can help you to solve this control because it is going to surface a lot more data from your endpoints. Again, that's an add-on. It's not included with the business premium subscription, but it is something that's definitely worth looking into. Um, it's known as an endpoint detection and response product, and it will surface a lot more information for those endpoint devices. So that basically concludes the first six critical security controls, the basic controls. And uh, from there, you know, it's really easy to leap off into uh, applying some of these other protections, email and web browser, malware defenses, you know, all, all these things become a lot much easier once you have control and leverage over those devices. And Microsoft 365 really helps get you uh, quite a long ways along that journey. So I would definitely recommend checking that out. Thanks, Alex. That was great. One of the things I really like about cybersecurity frameworks and CIS controls specifically is they tend to improve the maturity of the partner in their ability to deliver security services to their customers. So the customers benefit by being more secure, partners benefit a lot as well because they're more profitable. It's less operational expense and they're able to monetize these services that they, they sell their customers. 
Um, we know we've covered a lot of ground today, so Alex and I have put together a practical guide for implementing the CIS controls, and you can reach that guide at the link on the screen, aka.ms forward slash CIS4M365. Thank you very much. Have a great day.